Good morning, and we're excited uh, to dive into a new series. I'm calling it Renew, and you just saw a summary of the book of Ephesians. And we're going to dive into the book of Ephesians, and we're going to break it down. We're going to go bit by bit and work our way through and really study the details. Um, and here's what we're going to discover is that Ephesians, we discover a completely different paradigm for who we are as people, and that new paradigm transforms how we think and how we act. Now, the Apostle Paul writes Ephesians to explain this new paradigm to these people because he wants them to, to feel the side effects of that. And there's, there's incredible power in a paradigm. And when I'm talking about a paradigm, I'm talking about a set of theories or ideas that develop a framework by which we view the whole world. We, we have these assumptions, we have these baseline theories that determine how we approach life, that determine how we view others, and these paradigms set the agenda for everything. And today is Super Bowl Sunday. Oh wow, look, look at all the excitement. <laughs> is anybody excited about it? Gee, oh, we got a Chiefs fan. All right. How, how many just want to see the commercials? How many, how many just don't care at all? That, oh, there, oh, I see that hand. Okay. Um, well, I, I thought, you know, I, I need to do something kind of appropriate for the Sunday. And so I'm, I'm going to do, do an example based on football. Those of you who have been around a while, you might recognize the name Mike Ditka. He was the, the coach for the Bears. And some of you might know who he is, and some of you just don't care, and that's fine. Um, but in this particular game, the Bears were behind at halftime. And in order to make the point, Coach Ditka takes his men down to the uh, locker room and he pulls out a bucket, sticks his hand in the bucket, and when he pulls his hand out, attached to it is a snapping turtle. And he stands there unflinchingly and he gives this, this speech about being tough and tenacious and, and how they can do anything if they just, if they just have a sense of commitment. Well, at that time, there was Refrigerator Perry. Refrigerator Perry was about the size of a refrigerator, and he was a running back. And um, Coach Ditka calls out for a volunteer, and guess who volunteers? Refrigerator per Perry comes up, and he's standing there, and Coach Ditka says, okay, just a minute here, let me pry this thing off my hand, and, and then you can try it. And, uh, Refrigerator Perry says, no coach, you don't have to do that. Just stick out your other hand and I'll bite that one instead. <laughs> See, it's, it's all about perspective as to how you approach life. And the Apostle Paul is going to try to push our perspective into a new direction. And so let's, let's go into Ephesians chapter 1. We'll start at verse 1, and we're just going to work our way through the book. Not today, but eventually. Okay, so verses, uh, verses 1 and 2 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we, when we open up a letter, we, we just write, Dear John, Dear so-and-so. But back in that day, they, they had kind of a longer lead-in, and this is pretty standard for how to start a letter. You introduce yourself, and you introduce who you're going to talk to, and uh, so that's what Paul is doing here. Now, uh, keep in mind that the Apostle Paul did start this church. He had been there for two years, and so I'm not going to spend a long time on the intro because, because we're gonna, we have so much to cover. But I do want to point out that the Apostle Paul is in jail right now, and he's aware that this could be his last letter to these people. And so he's going to use this as an opportunity to kind of summarize everything that's important to him 
and get it out to them to make sure that they know how to follow Jesus. And so that's how he's started. And then in verse 3, this is what he says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Okay, so in the past, when I read this just in my Bible study time or whenever, I, I kind of read it in a mental monotone. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, I, I, don't, I don't think that's what he's writing. I think he's writing in all caps. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, I mean, he explodes onto the page. Like, who starts like this? Well, I, take, take this image. Have you ever, like, gotten a perfect score on the test, got the new job, had something exciting happen, and you came bursting through the door into the kitchen or into the living room and just made this huge announcement to the family expecting them to go like, yay! Well, that's what the Apostle Paul is doing. He's bursting through the door and he's coming in front of us and he's like, you guys, this is great. We, do you realize what we have? Like, praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is really good news. And that's exactly what this is about. And he says that the God and Father has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I just, I want you to absorb that for just a second. What does that mean? What does it mean to be blessed with every spiritual blessing? And, and I'm trying to picture it, and I'm, I'm having a hard time, and so the Apostle Paul helps us out in these next verses. Starting at verse 4, he says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. So, did you, did you get the list? Like, when I read it, I was like, okay, so what exactly, what exactly is he saying? And just so you know, the Apostle Paul is the king of the run-on sentence. Literally, if you read this in the Greek, verses 3 through 14 is one sentence. And not only does he give you the whole list in that one sentence, but then he explains his list in that sentence. So let's stop and just kind of sort this out and figure this out. And so uh, here are the list of the spiritual blessings. Our spiritual blessings are, he chose us, chose to see us as holy and blameless. He predestined us for adoption. He gave us redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He made known the mystery and he predestined us to be his glory. So there's the list. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to stop and slow down. We're going to pick apart all of these. And so this will be a couple of weeks that we're going to look through this list and really sort through what he means by this. And so let's start way back in uh, verse 4. He chose us as holy and blameless. So, God chose us in Christ to be holy and blameless from before the time he even created the universe. He chose us to be holy and blameless. As I looked at that, I thought, okay, now let's, let's explain some of those pieces. I, I'm actually going to start with blameless because 
the word blameless is fairly easy to define. It's without blame. He chose us to be without blame. Like, no accusation. Nothing against us. And so there's no fault. I, I have no faults in his eyes. And he chose us that way when we came to Christ. Now, I can give you a long list of the things I've done wrong. I, I can tell you things that embarrass me and that I hold against myself. But he can't. He has chosen to have those all erased so that I am blameless. That actually makes my head spin just a little bit. Because we don't let go of those things that easy. But I'm not only blameless, I'm also holy. Now, when, when I think of holiness, usually I think of something like being religiously untouchable. Like, because this is a religious item, you don't touch it, you don't mess with it, it's, it's holy. It's, it, there's a sense of purity to it. And so that's kind of the, the mental picture that I've always had. And yet, when I was in college, my college professor that was teaching us theology said, I, I, want, I want to adjust your picture of what holiness is. He said, your coffee maker is holy. Why? Because it only does one thing. It doesn't make spaghetti. It doesn't cook the potatoes. It, it does one thing. It makes coffee. It's holy. Completely separate. It's a separate unit to do one thing. Now turn around and imply that to you. You are holy. You were made for one thing. Have you found that one thing? Are you doing that one thing? Because you have a specific purpose that you were created for. And from the beginning of the world, God had you not only as blameless, but he has you set apart completely to do one thing. Something that no one else can do. And so you've been commissioned from him for a specific reason, for a specific purpose. Now, I want to just stop and ask the question, why is this a spiritual blessing? When you think about it, uh, this, is, this is pretty stunning. Because I, I have this thing inside of me that says, I mess up, I'm, I'm broken, I, I do stupid things. I disappoint myself all the time. But that is not how God sees me. I have been blessed as being blameless. And not only that, I, I have this sense of purpose. A purpose in my life where I'm not just here by accident and I, you know, I'm not just living day in and day out, just surviving. I have been created for a purpose. And, and when I realize that, it changes everything about who I am and where I'm going. So, when I believe that I'm a sinner, when I believe that I'm a screw-up, when I believe that's who I am, that's how I will act. Because when I'm convinced that I'm going to do those things, then I do those things. But when I'm convinced that I'm blameless, and that I'm holy, then I start to live that out. And maybe you've seen a child who has been raised with parents who scold the child and demean the child. They make all kinds of demands that the child live up to all kinds of expectations of perfection. And they point out every flaw and every mistake and everything is held against them. And, 
and they demean the child by saying, you are worthless and I wish you'd never been born. Now project into the future what the life of that child will be when he grows up. When they grow up in that kind of paradigm, they will live out that kind of paradigm. And what, what I have a tendency to do inside my head is to say all those things to myself. To tell myself that I'm worthless, that, that I'm a screw up, that I, I demand perfection from myself. And, and I find when I do that, I, just, I end up being more judgmental with others and self-defeated. And those, those inner messages actually demotivate me and destroy me. And for some reason, I even picture God leaning over the side of a cloud, looking down at me and going like, Paul, oh goodness, you idiot, come on, pull it together, fix yourself. I should, I should judge you for that one. And there you go, you, you messed up again. And, and I have this view of God, like he's, he's up there like a judgmental parent scolding me. And yet the Apostle Paul is trying to move our paradigm out of that. Now, I, if you've ever watched parents that are just really good at it, it isn't that they don't guide their children but they use a different system. They will go to that child and they'll go like, oh honey, we don't do it that way. Come on, when, if we do it that way, you know, you hurt other people and you're so much better than that. Like, this is, this is how we're gonna live. We're gonna live this other way. We're gonna, we're gonna build each other up and we're gonna take care of each other. And so let's not do it that way. And they're full, oh, you did that, that's great. I love the picture that you made for me. Oh, you, you made your bed? Well, that's great, thank you for making your bed. Let me help you a bit. You know, and there's these, they, they take interest in their child. And when a child has, has strengths, they notice it and and they help the child even develop those strengths early on. And when their child has weaknesses, they, they help them compensate in little ways in, and keep that positive flair moving. And you can imagine that a child who has those positive types of influences and those positive words flowing, their trajectory as adults is completely different than the child whose parents scold them. And this is what the Apostle Paul is telling us. He's saying, God looks at you and he says, you are my special child. You're blameless. You are absolutely, per I designed you perfect. And you were mine. I designed you for a very specific reason. You are, you are my delight. I love you. And I want a relationship with you because you, you're essential to the world that I designed. And when we begin to understand this spiritual blessing and apply it to our life, we begin to view our lives completely different. And I'm convinced that there are people here today who have been beating themselves up, seeing God as this judgmental, mean, angry parent who's scolding them and demanding perfection and wondering why they can't get their act together. And there's a spiritual blessing that I want you to have today. And the spiritual blessing is your God has made you blameless and holy. And he's calling you into his presence to delight in him and for him to delight in you. And when we begin to really view ourselves that way, there is a joy in life and a wholeness in life that begins to grow and multiply 
and transform our lives. And I, I want to take this thing right into our communion. You know, uh, just the other day, we introduced our values, and one of our values is authentic relationships. What we want is for, for you to have authentic relationships with each other, and for us to have authentic relationships with our Father. And in communion, what we celebrate is the opportunity for us to walk into the presence of God as blameless children who are holy and, and can, can walk into the throne room of God and ask whatever we need and know that our Father hears us. And communion is this celebration of an authentic relationship with the God of the universe. Where we can tell him, you know, this is what I'm struggling with. And to know that he's going to hear us and be with us. That he cares. And that through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we've been invited to be blameless and holy with him. So if you take the cup and peel the top section off and take the bread... on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He took bread and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. Let's do that now. And then he took the cup and he said to them, this is my blood poured out for the remission of sins. <laughs> it makes you holy and blameless to come into the presence of God. Whenever you do it, remember me. I want you to take just a minute and just talk to God about being holy and blameless. In the worship team, I'm going to have you guys come on at the same time. And then I'll close our, prayer, our silent prayer with a prayer and go into that last song. Jesus, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the concept of being holy and blameless in your sight. How in the world is that even possible? I, I see you. I see what you've done for us. I see your holiness. I see your perfection. And for you to call me holy and blameless is just it's almost confusing and yet that is how you see me and that's how you see us mm. help us to understand it help us to live it help us to, to really incorporate that into our lives where there's a sense of freedom and joy in coming into your presence as holy blameless people who can experience the love of God. Mm. Grow us into really seeing the spiritual blessings that you've given us, appreciating them as well as living them every moment of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.